Now the floor is open to uh, questions, comments. Uh, we have still some time uh, on Bhutan and Nepal. Uh, please, the, the gentleman there. Um, I would just like to make a comment about Dr. Pandey's presentation. Um, if for those of you that don't know very much about Nepal, that was a complete rewrite of the last 10 years of history in terms of the monarchy's role in the country. Um, it presented the monarchy as a victim, uh, and when in fact um, the last king was a uh, frankly authoritarian leader in the country. He said that uh, the king was the guardian of the constitution, but if, that the case, if that's the case, my question is, why did he suspend the constitution and uh, the prime minister in 2005, if not to just uh, expand his own powers um, and I, I agree with some of the criticism of the current political uh, climate and the Maoists. I fully agree with that. But uh, people do need to understand <laughs> that uh, the monarchy is, is not a victim in the country. And his um, uh, portrayal of masses of people coming out to, to see the king currently, that he's still a very popular figure, uh, I would take issue with that. I think there's no uh, evidence there. There, there, is a, there are a few royalists within the country who would like to push that agenda, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to that. Um, one comment, a question for Mr. Dorji about media freedom in Bhutan, because I think it's a very interesting topic. I noticed you worked for Bhutan Times a few years ago. Advertising, uh, government advertising in Bhutan is the number one source of revenue for the media. Um, and as such, the government has quite a lot of control over the content of the media. As you know, the Bhutan Times was recently forced to shut down. Uh, they were also a main critic of gross national happiness. And I'm wondering if you maybe could comment on the connection between the two, because as soon, you know, after, after a lot of criticism, the government removed government advertising from one single source, and that was the Bhutan Times. And as a result, they've had to shut down. Uh, and I think that actually is, 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 is quite a, a bit chilling, because it shows that while there has been a, a great deal of progress in media freedom and uh, democratization in the past few years, that you know there's still a lot of control within the government. Thank you. We don't have a constitution. We don't have a parliament. So it's a glass half full. Now, what, what you see from your perspective whether you see the glass as half full or half empty is your own perspective. I see it from my own perspective. Uh, what you said about King Narendra taking over, in 2002, all the major political parties petitioned to the king to dissolve the parliament. The parliament was dissolved by the recommendation of the prime minister of the day. Uh, he was only acting as a head of state. So that needs to be clarified. Second, all the political parties of Nepal have had the tendency to use the head of state for their own petty personal interests, like it is happening even today. Certain opposition political parties are requesting the president to sack the prime minister. So the same tendency goes on. And the head of state usually makes a decision on behalf of one or the other political party. And the other one, which is left out, criticizes the head of state. So the same. Uh, disease goes on even till today. But I want to go beyond that. We also used to have uh, in Nepal what we called uh, the lesser majesty law in which we were not allowed to criticize any members of the of the royal family at that time. And I teach at the university. I also give lectures at the Nepal Army Command and Staff College. And I used at that time I remember going to my class and this is very interesting. The students, especially girls, and these are master's level students, they used to come in half uh, sleeveless blouse and short skirts. And I told them, look, don't do two things in my class. Don't come in these uh, short skirts and don't bring your mobile phones because it disturbs me. 
I'm giving a lecture in my class and you are master's level students. Don't use, start using Facebook in my class and it disturbs me and don't wear these skimpy clothing. All the day, every time they used to do the same thing. And one day I said, you please go get out of this class. So she went, she went, the other day the same problem. Then one day I got fed up and I said, you do whatever you want to do, I will do whatever I want to do. Please go ahead, you can wear whatever you want, you can do whatever you want. From the fourth day, I saw some people wearing good clothes. Some people came in with national dress. And then it was freedom, total freedom to do whatever you want. So people became more disciplined in the class after I said everything is free. So that gave me, a, as an academic, that gave me an insight on Nepali society that whatever you say don't do, you have to do it. Because the young people are rebels. They like to do what you are told not to do. You cannot say these things. So they have to do it. At that time, since nobody was allowed to criticize the monarchy, there were a lot of rumors. And we had very funny rumors at that time that uh, the chief of police of Kathmandu Valley uh, to become the chief of police, which is a very rich position because, you know, once you become a police chief of Kathmandu, you become a multi, multi-millionaire. So you had to bribe the ADC to the king or you had to be very close to the royal palace to become the police chief of Kathmandu city. But that was a rumor. And there are all kinds of these rumors that the royal palace of Nepal would have a diamond shredded bathroom or uh, gold in the ceiling and all kinds of these things. When we became a republic and we made everything free, people went to the sea, the palace as a museum. There was nothing like that. The king's palace was more like a upper middle class family house of Kathmandu. Any industrialist would have the same kind of a house. His bedroom was nothing. So people saw the reality between the rumor and the actual truth. And when we opened the media to criticize, you can criticize anybody now. One month they criticized the king, second month they criticized the crown prince, third month, fourth month. People saw the absurdity with it and nobody no, no, nowadays nobody criticizes. So yes, everything is open, you can do whatever, you can say anything you like to anybody. They criticize the Maoists, the media goes against the political party leaders, but nobody criticizes the king anymore. Everything is free. So that big gives you a psychology of the society because I am an academic, I study societal behavior. That is the behavior. If you say, don't do this, you have to do it. When you make it open, two, three days, it will become a big, big classic problem. And then everybody says, uh, you are allowed to have your opinions uh, on the Nepali society. So uh, I, I, as I said to Jonathan, you have been studying Nepal. Uh, you know, it's, the glass is half full. It depends on how you look at it. Jonathan asked me about Bhutan Times and the closure of Bhutan Times. I would just want to make things clear here. Are you talking about Bhutan Times, the website, or the newspaper? Because actually the what was closed was the website and not the newspaper. And they are two different entities. Uh, what was closed was a website called BhutanTimes.com. And that is not a that is not moderated or in Bhutan. Uh, that is moderated from somewhere in the US and it's not actually run by residents of Bhutan also. But, uh, and that website, website was closed. So it has no relation with government ads because it doesn't depend on the government ads. It's based in the US. And we, we do have a newspaper called Bhutan Times and the website is bhutantimes.bt, which is still functional. Actually, uh, the, uh, what you pointed out is right. In Bhutan, about more than 80% of the ads do come from the government. And all the newspapers, particularly the newspapers, not only newspapers right now, even the radio stations, we have around half a dozen radio stations, 12 newspapers, and only one TV. Uh, the TV uh, licensing has become an issue right now back home uh, because the government has called for applications and uh, has actually shortlisted two, but has not given them the license. So there is, a, again, like Dr. Nischel was saying, there is a rumor that the government doesn't want to give the license before the elections, which is next year. But it is just a rumor. Uh, so the government act actually is a big concern. you know. And uh, if the government really wants, they can show us the whip using uh, this very figure. You know, uh, when I say that uh, more than 80% of the ads took up from the government still. 
uh, it is almost the side, the perspective of monarchy now. It is not a, that perspective of people of Nepal, I think so, because right now what people are thinking in Nepal in a society level, that is very different. Nepali people, they are very much empowered in the political system or politics in Nepal. Uh, as you talk about the role of monarchy, how the monarchy was favored to the people, but I think what I think is, I also was the movement in 2006 when the, there was big, uh, very huge uh, demonstration was there. They, all, all of the people, they were telling that the autocratic monarchy should go out. There's almost the people who are coming from outside of the valley, outside of the city. They were they were came from the grassroots level. Why the people had come and and that protest? There is some uh, there might might have some uh, causes behind it. In the Nepal before the long time, there is anti-monarchy uh, movement. We can see after the uh, it is maybe. Uh, from the 2000s, uh, 1960s, uh, there was uh, movement against monarchy. After the Mao's intervention, there was big. Uh, uh, many people were against the monarchy. That is not anymore, I think, because the political parties they have agenda of change and they they endorse the change agenda to the people. But there is no agenda to the people that didn't made by the monarchy. We, I don't know what agenda monarchy had that time. Uh, we can see how the people were not favored to the monarchy in Nepal. We can see the election of 2000, uh, the Constitutional Assembly. Almost the seats, uh, as you uh, mentioned by Pandey, must own the seats. What the cause? Is that only a rumor? I think Nepali people, they are more aware in the politics, so they don't uh, follow the, the only the rumor. They don't follow only the rumor. They, they can think about the politics. They can think about the system. So I think that was not humor. That was the people what they think and what, what they uh, uh, saw in the election. Uh, Nowadays, we can find like some political parties, they were favoring to the monarchy. But now, like Raprapa, uh, Jan Shakti Party, they were favored to the monarchy, but now they are not favoring to the monarchy. Why? What the reason behind it? Uh, another one, my question is, like, in a democratic process, we are in a democratic republic now. In a democratic process, uh, they can elect it by the people. Can the, can the king of Nepal, he can go to the people for vote and trying to get a, a popular vote from the people? Another, another thing I found in the society level, like Nepal is in transition in political change. Uh, Nepal is trying to uh, change capitalist, capitalism, go, uh, trying to go to capitalism through feudal society. The source of feudal society in Nepal is monarchy. Like they have made the Hindu kingdom, that's the source of Hindu, Hindu uh, kind of uh, trend they try to impose in Nepali society. People didn't like that, so they opposed that and they, they said we need secular state in Nepal. Another thing is, I like monarchy is not a king only; it is a, it is a structure. So people, there was power with the king. Later, it has gone to the political parties. People are not happy with that the uh, political party leader as well. They want power with themselves. So uh, I think uh, this is my opinion, and I have some questions or suggestions. That's all. Well, I just want to uh, comment on GNH. It's like uh, GNH values is our development model. And uh, we take certain pride in being a GNH nation. And now Bhutan, as Bhutan is becoming more active in this globalized world and interacting with, you know, uh, the rest of the world and, uh, and uh, like the, the participation is more intense than before. Do you think there is any need to compromise in the pillars and the indicators and variables? This is my question, thank you. I would like to ask you, uh, from now on, how long does it take or how many years for Nepal to be stabilized in government? Because I have known that there are many bonds each week and you know that this year is like 2012 and it's the year of Lumpini tourist year. And you know that Nepal would like to promote uh, the country as tourist country. However, there are bonds in each week and on the roads 
and how uh, can government uh, manage with this strike? Thank you so much. I just want to know the future. I mean, like, what do you think of the future? Do you think that the institution of monarchy might be restored in Nepal? And in case it is, um, will that bring more stability to the country? I've been to Nepal many times. One recent apparent development has been the emergence of the issue of ethnicity within politics. The Janajati, each wanting to be represented in ways they weren't represented in the past. This, in a country of 30 million people approximately with many, many different languages and nationalities, do you see this as a very serious political issue or something which uh, can be uh, coped with given all the other tr stresses that the Nepali system has to deal with? So, uh, Nepal has traditionally been a buffer between China and, uh, uh, and uh, India. And uh, I'd like to know how are these two big powers now uh, coping with this instability uh, along their borders? Are they taking what kind of role are they playing? To, are they playing any um, positive role in, in, in Nepal's transition? Uh, I have a question for Mr. Dorji. Uh, I was struck by how much of a, a political project uh, you have uh, presented GNH as. That it, it, uh, and I think this conflicts with uh, what some of us have as a preconceived notion that there is some cultural support for the pursuit of happiness in Bhutan independent of the measurement of it. And so the, the impression that I get is that uh, Bhutan essentially isn't in any different position than any other country that might adopt the measurement of happiness as a goal uh, as a way of actually promoting happiness. Is that the impression you want to get, that, give that there is no uh, particular cultural history or cultural support for happiness in Bhutan? Thank you. I'll try to do that uh, in about a few minutes. That's a whole mouthful of uh, issues and you're going very deep into these uh, intricacies of internal politics. Nepal has not stabilized. We've had 19 prime ministers in 19 years. We have had five constitutions in six decades. Now these are brutal facts. The problem now is that we don't have a full-fledged constitution despite of the election of the constituent assembly. Another brutal fact we don't have a parliament. So when you look at this entire situation, you are bound to have troubles. Nepalese society is very large. 30 million people is a mid-sized European country. We have more population than in Australia and Malaysia. It could be small when you compare it with India and China, but we are a very large country. There are people of different shades and different opinions. But whether you are a rightist, a democrat, centrist, leftist, or an extreme leftist. First thing for Nepal right now, and this comes to his question, is to have a constitution. That is the fundamental. Unless we say we have become Great Britain, we don't need a constitution. That's a different matter. But any modern day state, first, foremost, needs a constitution that everybody abides by. Right now, everything is in terrible. So this kind of a situation is in the benefit of nobody. And this will create more problems. There will be more strikes. After the festival of Diwali, the festival of Tiwar, some political parties are again going to the streets. Yes, I agree with you. There is a danger that the tourism industry will be crippled again. I hope there will be sense among all major political parties that we need to stabilize, we need to move ahead, and uh, we need to be a prosperous nation. So this, this de depends um, on a host of factors and this goes to his question on the issue of federalism. Uh, when you have a grandfather in your house, an old grandfather, everybody respects him. And the, and the grandfather is blamed for everything else in the house. It is because of him that this has not happened. It is because of him that we are not liberal and democrat. It is because of him that there is no freedom in this house. When the old grandfather dies, then you realize that he was also important. So the same thing has happened to Nepal. We, we, we relied very heavily on the institution of monarchy. 
when we removed it then we have to do it ourselves the political parties have to do it themselves these people have to do it themselves and we are only learning to do it ourselves from the last 6 7 years we are in perpetual transition and this has been one of the problems because yes we relied very heavily on the grandfather because he has he was doing everything for us and uh, now that he is no more that we have to learn to do it ourselves he is not going to do it nobody else is going to do it you have to do it yourself and there is going to be problem on the issue of federalism we are a country with 102 declared recognized ethnic groups and today every major ethnic group wants a federal state of its own federalism cannot be carved on the basis of ethnicity in a country with 102 ethnic groups federalism has to be carved on the basis of resources economy a host of factors if you start carving out on the basis of ethnicity then why shouldn't a brahman have a federal state why should a majority ethnic group have a federal state it becomes a problem another problem is that all these federal states in nepal that we are imagining don't have a majority of any ethnic school, ethnic group so an ethnic uh, federal state of the tamuan does not have gurungs as the majority the ethnic federal state of magarath does not have magars as the majority somebody else is a majority so this is another trouble spot so therefore we have a host of problems and the neighborhood as the lady from the european union asked me they are very large powerful neighbors rising asian giants of the 21st century india and china both have high stakes in a chaotic and unstable nepal india has cultural religious linguistic ties with nepal but it is also true that the maoist leadership stayed in india for much of the insurgency period and today everything is declassified mr prachanda goes to on television and says that i lived in gurgaon i lived in gorakhpur i lived in delhi he the leadership found shelter in india because it is an open society india is an open society and the nepal army could never find them not even a single polit bureau member was killed during the insurgency so there was another problem so therefore to defeat an insurgency you need the support of uh, you need you need not only support but you need a, a very good neighborhood that's what was my part of my presentation but not always does a state support but there could be non state actors that are supporting the insurgency for instance we had naxalite groups we had uh, mao cpi m leaders communist party leaders in india that were friends of the mao party leaders in nepal so that was also another factor and that brings me to the final uh, intervention i'm trying to do this very quickly the lady here what do you think is going to be the future of nepal i think that's a very important question i am not an astrologer uh, there was a a very famous writer in the 17th century who was a governor general in india he published the first book on nepal and those days nepal's name used to be nepaul n e p a u l nepaul and this is a very good sentence that he wrote in that book i request you to remember this sentence whatever should happen never happens and what should have never happened always happens in nepal <laughs> thank you very much uh my friend asked me whether there is a need to compromise gnh on gnh pillars and indicators uh definitely not uh but you see i think we as a country should understand the difference between the academic pursuit of gnh and uh also the need like i stressed that need to make it more practical while the academic work is on i think there should also be a broader consultation with the people and equally uh there should be an effort to make it practical i think right now all the efforts are towards implementing policies all the efforts are towards coming up with pro gnh policies but the state and the government is not really thinking about you know no, whether people have a positive outlook towards gnh and by the way i'm not against gnh i'm personally you know i might have sounded in my presentation as if i am against gnh i'm not but uh at the ground level like i have like i have shared you know people are fed up there is a gnh fatigue and that can uh that we cannot uh choose to ignore that 
we have to acknowledge that and i think that has to be uh, accommodated in uh, in in some ways so to, uh, the direct answer would be while you know the economic pursuit is there you know the uh, efforts to make it more practical on the ground should also be there and uh, the gentleman out there asked me whether there is any cultural support uh, to advocate JNS definitely it is there and like I said in the uh, in the presentation uh, the pursuit of JNS in itself I think uh, is the end goal in itself but you know, uh, Bhutan has very successfully given the picture that it is the Shangri-La and it is the land of happiness, and it is different. Of course, it is different. But at the ground level, there would definitely be challenges. And my attempt today was to highlight some of the challenges that is there. Uh, the journey is not all, uh, all uh, a smooth sailing. There, there are challenges, uh, and uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me bring this forum to a close. I think we've had a very uh, intriguing, insightful, uh, interesting, of course, uh, speakers and the uh, presentations. I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave a lot uh, behind. Uh, we'll have it up on YouTube. I, I think that there will be some, some people who want to view it uh, in, in hindsight. Please join me in thanking uh, both uh, Dr. Nishao Pandey and uh, Mr. Taji Doji uh, for being with us today uh, from, from far away. Thank you very much. You. Our next uh, ICC event will be on November 20th. Uh, November 20th is a Tuesday. It will be post-US elections and the meanings and implications for Southeast Asia and Thailand. Thank you very much.